here tonight, I want you to turn in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 30, Proverbs 30. And as you do, I just want to thank you online and here just for your prayers over these weeks. Do appreciate it uh, during being away and then sick and all the rest. And uh, prayers are absolutely vital in the work of God and we need them. And uh, we pray that the Lord will move in our lives. Those that are still fighting sickness, pray for them, that God will retouch them and raise them up. And we do, we are so grateful for all of those online in different places and different countries that uh, God is dealing with. And our entire world is going through something where we are passing through this together. No matter where we live or where we are at, it's an utterly unique hour. Turn into Proverbs 30, and I told you in the weeks before that I was going to preach a little series or um, something to that effect, and you're trying to find out what is this little series or preaching on something little. And it's hard for you to believe I'll preach a little series, and it's hard for you to believe I'll preach a little message. But I want to tell you here that my subject is little. That's what my subject is. That's what the theme of our new series and of this message tonight, reading from Proverbs 30, Brother Sofa already knows where I'm going to in a little part. If he says he doesn't, then there's, um, he, he's wrong, he ought to. But reading from Proverbs 30, and this is my message tonight, and this is the beginning of a new series that I just want to simply give simple exhortations for this hour that I believe are very, very important. And this is my title, Little Things of Scripture. Little Things of Scripture. Reading from Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24, just four verses here tonight as we open up. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 24. You got it in the end. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The answer of people not strong, yet they prepared their meat in the, in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. And then fourth and lastly, the spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Please pray with me here tonight. Father, we do thank you for the word of God. We thank you, nor God, for these times where we come together. Nor God, we do not despise the day of small things because, oh God, we know all through biblical history and all through church history, you've done remarkable things. Nor God, through little people, little ladies, Lord God, through little faith, through little gatherings. And oh God, we do not despise that work which we know and are confident is from you. Here for a few moments, my God, show us the importance of little things from the Bible by the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. My message little things of scripture and I'm laying a foundation here. I actually came prepared with two messages and I had to change midway. So I've got two here um, depending on what happens tonight. But I want to lay a foundation. All I'm doing is stirring up your mind, your heart, your thoughts, your feelings, the remembrance of your own life to pinpoint one thing from Scripture, little things. I want to emphasize it. I want you to become aware tonight before we go into other things because I'm going to get very specific and deal with very important things. But here tonight, I want you to get an awareness that the Holy Spirit 
God, the creator of all things, counts little things to be important things. In fact, I'd go much further, that there is a complete biblical teaching, doctrine, theology from Genesis to Revelation about little things. Let me just stir you up for a second. The Bible talks about the danger of a little sleep, the danger of a little folly. It several times talks about and gives us stories about a little lady and something remarkable coming out of that. When we go to the New Testament, we read at least four times concerning four different kinds of dangerous leaven. It says a little leaven. The Bible also talks not only about great faith, but little faith. With all these things, we begin to see the importance of little things within the Bible. The New Testament, Jesus teaches again about being faithful in little things. He also, uh, going to the book of James, we read about the danger of a little member, which is your tongue. In fact, James goes to great lengths to emphasize how dangerous this very little member. In fact, it's more dangerous than anything else. And I'm sure we'll get there at some point. And then you come over to the book of Revelation, and you read about a little book in the hand of the Lamb of God. What a remarkable book. It may be a little book. It may be an insignificant book, a book rejected and mocked by this generation. And yet what a dynamic book that's molded our world. We also read in the Old Testament about the danger of despising the day of small things. So it's not only the word little that we're looking at in this, these messages. It's the word little. It is the word small. Do not despise the day of small things. There are days which in the church are days of small things. Be very careful how you think about them. You see, what I'm telling you is little things are very important. You cannot miss this. If you treat little things as unimportant things, you're on very dangerous ground. If you treat little things as secondary issues rather than primary issues, you're really going to make a lot of mi mistakes. If you don't invest in small things, if you don't emphasize small things, if you don't watch over small things, you'll really get yourself in trouble. James also uses the example of a very small helm or rudder in a ship. They can steer a great ship by a very small instrument. Small things can move large things. Small and significant people can change nations. Again, reading about Christ in the New Testament, we read about the boy with loose and fishes. So we not only read about little things and small things, but we have stories that talk about little things. They don't call them little, they don't call them small, but here's a little boy and he has a little dinner. He has uh, his bread and his fish. And if you're not careful, you could miss a miracle. Do you remember what Christ asked the disciples? What are we going to do with all this crowd? 5,000, 10,000, all out here, nothing to feed them with. What are you going to do? Well, you know what? All they could do is bring this little boy and they almost missed it. Can you imagine seeing the need, seeing the thousands, seeing the danger? And you look at this little boy and his dinner and you say, it's nothing. It's nothing. Do you see the danger? When you begin to go into this, and I'm, I'm giving you an overview here, I want you to understand the importance of little things, small things, insignificant things. It's all through the Bible. In fact, it's dominant. Do you know what that shows me? The Holy Spirit of God who inspired this book is trying to get a message across. When we go to some of the greatest acts in the Bible, it's remarkable. You remember how God sends Moses to Pharaoh? What does he give him in his hand? A rod. When David goes to fight Goliath, what does he have in his hand? A slingshot. 
when Shamgar rises up in his generation to stand against 600 of the enemy, what does he have in his hand? He has an old ox goat. When Samson rises up against the Philistines, what does he use to slay a thousand? The jaw of an ass. When you begin looking at the mind of God and the plan of God and the purpose of God, you see that little things play a central, significant and important role. Little circumstances of life. And we're going to look at some of them over these weeks. Little circumstance, little individuals, happen chance meetings with someone else. Being at a certain place at a certain time that was utterly unique and your life would have been very, very different. You see, when we begin to look at all of these things together, we see the importance of little things in Scripture. And I'm laying the foundation. I hope already your mind and your heart is opening to this. This is the Word of God. This is the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Many years ago, you know my past, my education. And you know my education didn't stand up for much. My primary school days were awful from P3 through to P7 and all, all the rest. It was awful. Working up through those years, it was awful. I learned very little. My teacher said, Sat, sit there and don't you bother. I don't know why she said that. But there's one thing one of my teachers taught and it impacted me, and I never forgot it. In fact, it was about a little thing. It intrigued me. It fascinated me. And in fact, it was this thought that really inspired this message, because as a child of seven, eight, nine, and 10, this thought so fundamentally impacted me that I've never been free of it. And from a child, I've realized little things are very important to watch over. And if you don't pay attention to the little things, all the big things of life will come to wreck and ruin. You say, well, what was this your teacher taught you at school that was so important? It was a little rhyme and it went like this. For the want or the loss of a nail. I meant to have a nail here tonight, an old rusty nail I forgot. For the loss of a nail, a shoe was lost. For the loss of a shoe, a horse was lost. For the loss of a horse, the rider was lost. For the loss of a rider, the battle was lost. He was so important, not one rider on the horse. For the loss of a battle, the war was lost. And for the loss of a war, a kingdom was lost. All for the loss of one nail. When my teacher taught us that, it had a profound effect on me. And I know it's carnal and worldly and it's secular. But oh, what wisdom. You see, I believe in that little story, the loss of a nail that leads to a loss of an entire kingdom. It isn't silly. It's not foolish. In fact, if you dare think that a loss of a nail isn't important, the right nail in the right place to do the right job, if you do not think that's worth watching over, then you don't know what the Bible teaches. Do you remember those other children's rhymes? A stitch in time saves nine. I was raised with this sort of thing. I don't know what you get taught these days in school, but a stitch in time saves nine. You can either do one stitch now and I'll save an awful lot of work. But if you neglect and say, it doesn't matter, just leave it, I'll do it later, I'll do it next month, you could end up, instead of doing one stitch in your sock, you could do nine stitches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I know they've had to invent new sayings in our generation. They've thrown out all of this sort of logic in our school. And I'd hate to hear what kids get taught now. Or what about the little statement, big things come out of small things or very good things. Yeah. In other words, when a child at Christmas gets a little box, don't get disappointed. Very good things can come out of very small boxes. And so my message is little things of Scripture. And I want to give you four 
points here and I'm just laying the foundation and we're going to go deeper in the weeks ahead. And this is my first point, going to the scripture where we open Proverbs 30. My first point, the wisdom of small things. The wisdom of small things. Proverbs 30, 24. What does it say here? There be four things which are little upon the earth. The writer of the psalm and the Holy Spirit who breathed on him and inspired him to write this was writing something very profound. You see, God wants us to look at four little things upon the earth. They are little. The word's emphasized there. And do you know what that little means? It means they are weak. They are small. They are insignificant. You could actually mess a lot because they're little. With little things, we've got a proneness to say it's not important. There's nothing profound there. It cannot make a big difference. But God doesn't say that. God created all these animals. God gave us all these examples. God gave us the scripture that says there be four things which are little upon the earth. And so we hear, here see the wisdom of small things because he says, but, now they are little, but they are exceeding wise. So these four animals he's going to mention, he says they are little. They are little, exactly what we're saying here. And this is a theme throughout the Bible. Why did God make these animals little? You see, God molded these animals to think in a particular way, act in a particular way, to be a certain way. And he made them little. He didn't make them like the elephant. He made them little upon the earth. But built within these four things, they are exceeding wise. In other words, they are very wise. They are great in wisdom. So God has taken these four little creatures and he has hidden his divine wisdom in them. And it's a message for you. It is a lesson for you in this church. It's a lesson for everyone who listens that within very little insignificant, you see, we have all across the church, oh, I'm nothing. I can't do anything. I can't speak. I can't think. I can't preach. I can't evangelize. I can't pray. I can't believe. I can't serve God. And you paralyze yourself. Do you realize the only thing that's hindering you is yourself, your faith, your attitude, your obedience? And you can begin to think, oh, but I'm only a little thing, or this is a little church, or my faith is little. You are going to decide whether that restricts you or not. And so we have four creatures. They are little, and yet they're exceeding wise. Let's look at these four animals for a moment. Verse 25, the answer of people, not strong. So notice here the thing, their littleness is expressed by lack of strength. They do not have strength, and yet they prepared their meat in the summer. And this is our first lesson here, the wisdom of small things. And God gives us the ant as an example. I hope you consider the ant. I hope you study the ant. I hope you look at it when you're there and you begin to see the ant and go, do you know the Holy Spirit uses the ant as a lesson to Christians in the church? And that's how important the ant is. You see, God created the ant. Very small, not much strength. Do you ever see an ant pick something up and carry it? Do you ever see how small and feeble an ant is? And yet it's a remarkable animal. God says it is exceeding wise. That little ant, God gave it wisdom in an absolute extraordinary way. Now look how its wisdom is expressed. They prepared their meat for the summer. This is what God is saying. You want to know the importance of little things. You can be little and prepare for the winter. You could be very little with very little strength, like the ant. You go, I do not have strength. I do not have power. I do not have reputation. Nobody hardly takes note of me. And yet if 
you have the wisdom of God. You can actually express an exceeding wisdom of God in your life. You could be utterly unnoticed in the body of Christ. I mean worldwide. And yet you could be exceedingly, overwhelmingly filled with the wisdom of God. And that's what this ant was. What did it look like? He prepared his meat in the summer for the winter. Now listen about ants. They hibernate for winter. They don't like the cold. They're like some of us. And they have to endure and survive extremely cold temperatures. They're going to face snow and ice and hail and cold winds blowing. That would kill them. Do you understand that? They are so little and of such little strength, they do not have the ability to fight all of these things. They cannot handle the torrents of rain. They cannot handle the heaviness of snow and the coldness of snow. This little ant cannot endure these things. It would never survive these things. And you know what? You're the same. There's certain things in life you could not endure through. There's certain things that when you look forward, and especially in this hour, people are looking into 2022 and they're going, how am I going to go through this dark winter? How am I going to face the trials ahead? How am I going to uh, go through losing my job or suffering or facing things? Do you know how it is to have the wisdom of God, a wisdom that overflows you? Do you know there's a wisdom that is greater than that little ant? That little ant could not have created this wisdom. You see, that little ant that comes and begins to prepare and think and make ready for the winter. Do you realize that little ant <clears throat> didn't begin doing that itself? It didn't decide to do that. You see, all that principle of wisdom that says, I've got to prepare for the winter. I've got to make ready. And has the wisdom, the know-how, the ability. The fact of having that, it's been going on for generations. Generations of ants have had this wisdom to do it. And they grew up thinking, I've thought of this, maybe. And yet, it is the wisdom of God placed within them. What does the wisdom of God look like? It prepares for winter. You see, they hibernate during winter. They won't survive it. They can't endure it. They can't walk through it. So what do they do? They hibernate. They prepare during the summer months from springtime all the way through to autumn. They are making ready. They're preparing all through the good days. They're preparing for the bad days. It is in the light they're preparing for the darkness. It is when there is plenty. They are making ready for a day when there's very little. You see, a lot of Christians are going to get caught out. They've never prepared or stored up the spiritual. They do not have the wisdom of God. They're not looking ahead saying, I've got to prepare for dark hours. How am I going to stand when I'm tested or tempted or tried or threatened? Will you prepare now? Spiritually, you prepare. You see, what does that do? They collect food ahead of time. They store extra food up in their stomachs and within the queen um, ant of the whole nest. They prepare their entire colony, colony for winter. They know winter's coming. They know the dark hour is coming. Do you know what you do? You prepare for it. Do you see the wisdom of small things? Yes, you're small. Yes, you're small and insignificant, but you can have a wisdom that when the worst days, the coldest days, the darkest days come, you will actually, because of the wisdom of God, you're not taken by surprise. You're fully prepared. You're fully ready. Everything is fully stored up. Now you're just waiting. Do you know what you do? It's time to hibernate. You see, they work for the colony, not for individual plans and purposes. The, this process of preparation takes time. You're not going to do it in the next week. Some Christians now are scrambling. They grew up on a prosperity message. They grew up on a message that say, God would never allow you to suffer. God isn't, God's going to keep everything just perfect for you, long enough for you to get out of this earth. 
and it's all you're going to tiptoe through the tulips without any battles and without any scars. I want to tell you, that's a very strange teaching. The Bible says this little thing, this ant, is prepared for the darkest, coldest, and hardest times. It is laboring and preparing. Do you know also, I I heard this from a guy who looks after ants. He breeds them, and and Hannah would just love this uh, in in, in your garden or in your back spare room. All, All of these ants and and generating them and breeding them and studying them. What a new study, the study of ants. Well, this guy who done that, he actually said that during the winter, an ant produces, if I can say this right, a glyrosyl antifreeze in its body. It doesn't have it during the summer, but it creates this antifreeze that it puts out into its blood and circulates in its system. This um, uh, glyrosyl, he actually said that they used to use it in cars and windows in olden days. They would extract this, this substance, and it's in the body of the ant. So you have this ant, the wisdom of God displayed in this little ant, and it even uh, secretes its bed and some of the hallways of its palace with the same stuff because the winter is coming in. Only during winter does it have that or need that. You see, they have adapted themselves to survive in any climate, whether it's hot or cold or wet or whatever, an ant is going to function. Whenever the cold winter comes and you go, that must have killed all the ants. Just you wait. Just you wait. You're going to find springtime comes and here they all come. They blocked the ways in and outs of their nest. They blocked it all up. They gathered together to keep warm. And you know what? They come out. That's why I say the Bible talks about the wisdom of small things. Secondly, and Brother Soof once preached on this, is the conies. That's the second thing in verse 26. Look what it says with me here for a moment. It says the conies are but a feeble folk. They make their houses in the rocks. What a statement. It's the same thing being shown. A coney is a little thing, but exceeding wise. Now, what is this coney that the Bible speaks about? We see with the ants, their wisdom is displayed in preparation for the winter. But the coney reveals its little, but it displays exceeding wisdom. How? By finding a secure place in the rock. The word coney or the name coney means to conceal hidden away from the eye of man as a valuable thing. In other words, the coney chooses a position to bring security. It chooses the rock. It's a little thing. In fact, it's very small, a bit like the size of a rabbit, but more like a guinea pig. It is very cuddly if you see the pictures of it. It it, it is something you would want to embrace. No claws, nothing dangerous about it, no way to defend itself, no way to fight its enemies. None of these things, nothing of it is built in, but it does have wisdom. God has given that little cuddly guinea pig, this coney, it is built within it wisdom to secure it from its many enemies. When Brother Suf preached on this, he, he very kindly gave me this information and that message about this cuddly guinea pig called a coney, about all of its enemies. When you go to Africa, you read it's got a great many enemies, leopards, puff adders, cobras, pythons, wild dogs, hawks, owls, eagles, to mention a few. These are all the enemies of this little cuddly teddy bear of a coney. This innocent, defenseless, hopeless little creature could never survive in the terrain that God has placed it. And yet, do you know what? The Bible says it is exceeding great in wisdom. This little creature has so much wisdom in the midst of all of its enemies. You know what it does? It goes and makes its home in the rocks. 
It actually hides in the rocks. And as it hides in the rocks, it is defended from all its enemies. It cannot defend itself. It has got no claws. It has got no skill to run. But you know what it does have wisdom is to say the rock is a place of refuge. I can hide in the rock from all of my enemies. Psalm 104 says the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. The conies are a feeble folk. <laughs> Look at the conies. They're so feeble. They'll never survive. They'll never manage. But you know what the Bible actually says? It says they make their houses in the rocks. Where have you made your house? Are, are you hidden? Do you, have you found a rock to hide in? The storm is coming. The storm is here. The storm is hitting our nations. Where have you made your refuge? <coughs> Third of all, verse 27, <coughs> we read about the locusts. Verse 27, the locusts of no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. The locusts we know do not have a supreme leader over them. And yet as you look at the locusts, you see an order, you see a structure, you see a unity, you look at formations, bands of them, and in fact they gather together in great numbers. They are such a small, insignificant creature. They have no leader to command them. Do you see the wisdom that is displayed here? The wisdom of small things. If you study that, you're going to become very prepared for the days ahead. If you study the coney, you're actually going to know how to hide yourself, no matter how great the enemies. You'll go, there's one place of refuge in the rock. If, if like the locusts, you study them, you're going to see the a low, a very small, insignificant thing with no one to stand over them and watch and make sure they're operating, yet there is a great unity and order in the locusts. What an amazing animal they are. They go forth, all of them, by bands. Church of God, we need bands in the church of God. I mean all over this world. Like the locusts, they're small, they're insignificant, there is nothing. But if you have the wisdom of God, Bands of Christians are going to formulate all across this world. Do you know what's happening right now with the darkness of night and the troubles and the problems that are coming in all over the world? New groups of Christians are formulating everywhere. They're banding themselves together. They don't even know what to call themselves. They, they're not even sure if they're a church yet. They don't even have a pastor or a preacher. But you know, all over the world, Christians are saying, we need to band together. It's a dark hour. It's an evil. Do you know what that shows? Exceeding wisdom. Uh, there's a br br lovely message from a brother, I think in Canada. And he says, as soon as all the churches locked down at the beginning of this Christ, all of them just shut down and you couldn't find a church to go to. He said, 12 of us began to meet together. We banded together. They may not call themselves anything, but you know what? They joined together as the body of Christ. And he said, we have had the most powerful, wonderful times. Do you know what that is? That's little things being exceedingly wise. And fourth, do you know what? I told Candace, I said, I've got three messages, but I'm leaving one of, the, one of them to next week. I, 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 I said, uh, uh, then those two, I've got to decide, I'm, I'm wrestling here, just an hour before coming out, I went, oh no, I've got not, not one message here, I just, well, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm just looking for the wisdom of God, need that wisdom of God to come to us. But the fourth thing here, and let me deal with this, the fourth thing is the spider. In verse 28, it says, The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. 
She is in king's palaces. So look at the fourth and last thing. Small things yet wise. The wisdom of small things. Do you realize God the Holy Spirit has built this in that no small group of Christians can say we're too little. We cannot affect a nation. Do you know what? If you don't learn the lesson of that nail, the loss of a nail could bring about the loss of a kingdom. But also it happens in reverse. To watch over a nail, to repair a nail, to keep a shoe on, you could save a kingdom. Do you realize that your life, your child, your relationship, this church, the knock on a consequence, you deciding something, you initiating something, you starting something. Do you realize the knock on effect, the worldwide effect of little things? You see, if we're a church that emphasizes the small, I want to watch over the little. I, even if it's a little faith, I want to nurture it and guard it and protect it. And I don't want to use it. Some people say, I want great faith. Sure, you don't use the little faith you have. You will never have great faith because you actually despise a little faith. You don't use it. You neglect it. You watch over it saying, when is God going to give me good faith, great faith, great faith, large faith, mighty faith, miracle working faith. When you begin to use your little puny bit of faith that God has given you. I've watched people all through the years do this. Remember the parable Jesus told and the one with one talent, it wasn't the one with 10, it wasn't the one with five, but the one with one talent, he said, well, master, I knew how hard you are. I, I, I knew that you're a hard task, master, and I only have one. They had five and they had 10. I only had one and I was very scared of losing it. So I hid it in the ground and I waited for you to come back. Remember what he called him, an evil servant. He said, so you took what I gave you and you hid it and did nothing with it. If you do nothing with your faith, then it'll be taken away from you, even that which you have. You remember all the principles, and I'm trying to lay a principle in in a series, very important series. This belongs in those doctrinal teachings that say, if you want to be the greatest, you must become the least. If you want to be the first, then you'll be the last. If you're the last, you'll be the first. If you want to be the big man, you're going to find yourself right at the bottom of the rung. Those who go to the bottom rung, go to the lowest place and serve all and wash the feet of all, they're suddenly going to find promotion cometh from the Lord. You see, all these principles are dynamic, and yet most of the church don't teach them. Preachers don't teach them. They want to teach people how to walk in water, and I've never met a man in my life who did. Not one. I believe in miracles. I believe it can happen, but I've never met all the sermons about having faith to walk in water, and I've never met other, one other man to counterfeit it, or should I say to copy it. But do you know what? All these principles of being the least, being the last, and the little things get ignored terribly. This fourth and last thing, the spider. What does the spider do? The spider is marked by preparation and its wisdom. The spider taketh hold with her hands. She begins to spin, to work, to make webs, to make homes. It's, and listen this, what does it do? What does the spider do? It's so little, insignificant. Look at it. It's building its home with its hands. When you see someone at the side of the road and they're building their house from scratch, you know this is a little person. It's not an important person. It's not a rich person. It's not a person of great reputation in Limerick. When they're literally starting to knit together and build their home, you'd say this is a very small, very insignificant, someone of no reputation, of no resources. 
Be very careful with the spider, you know. As you look at the spider, do you know what you see? You see one who can penetrate right into the palaces of kings. That's what the Holy Spirit says here. It says, and he is in king's palaces. This insignificant creature that starts to build its house with its own hands out of nothing begins one line, one line, one line. Do you know how they built a way across Niagara Falls? Do you, do you know the story of it? Little things. There was a young boy, a boy, with a kite, and he flew it, and the rope went out further and further and further, and that little line managed to get right across Niagara Falls. Do you know what they started doing was going back and forth, and then he attached a bit of wire, and then something thicker, and this went on and on and on, like the spider. Have you ever seen the determination of a spider? Just one line. You go up into your office, you haven't been there for an hour, and you go, I just touched something there. It is one line. Do you know how determined that that spider is? It is a little insignificant thing that has to build from start from nothing, and yet it is exceedingly full of wisdom. Unbelievable, remarkable wisdom. It's a remarkable wisdom that it has. It goes straight into the palace of kings. There's not a king's palace that doesn't have a spider in it. There's, there's not the a greatest house in Limerick where there aren't spiders building their homes. They must say, look at my house. You know, the poor guy spent all his fortune and the spider is saying, this is my home, this is where I built, I chose this palace, I chose this parliament building, I chose the great houses of the earth. There's no Hollywood star that doesn't have spiders who have penetrated, that go right into the midst of it. Do you realize if you understand what I'm saying, you may not have a penny to your name, you may not have any reputation, you may not think that you have got great faith. But if you actually walk in little things, you, there's nowhere on the face of the planet. You say, I could go into closed countries. I could travel if all the airlines shut down. I actually have the wisdom of God in me to know what to do and how to do it and when to do it. I've got all of these things. I've got the wisdom of God in me to know what to do. Whether it's like the ant or the coney or the locust or the spider. You know that spider has such wisdom saying no prison bars. You know, do you know spiders break into prisons? I don't know whether you ever knew that. They've got such wisdom that they'll say, we'll build a home inside a prison. You bunch are trying to escape. You bunch want to get out. I'm getting in out for shelter. I'm choosing your corridors. And all you guys, you prisoners, you're going to have to clean all the cobwebs. We, we are building our home everywhere. We're invading your home. We're taking over. We're choosing. If you don't clean up, I assure you, they'll take over those spiders. Saints of God, I'm just beginning to show you the greatness of little things, small things, insignificant things. Let me finish here with just some truths pulled out of Scripture. Lessons about little things in Scripture as we close here. I'm laying a foundation, and next week... I'm going to get very specific. It says in Psalm 37, verse 16, a little that a righteous man hath, a little, if you're righteous and you have very little, maybe there's people watching, and I know there is, and they've lost their job. Their convictions, their biblical beliefs and Bible prophecy, their unawareness that something is wrong, and they've lost business, and they could lose home, and they've lost job, and their family think they're crazy. Do you know it says, a little that a righteous man has, you've got to learn this. Because if you don't learn this, you can be manipulated. You'll actually say, I've got to hold on to certain things, and you could be deceived. A little 
Are you satisfied with a little? Are you dreaming, thinking, and there's nothing wrong to expand or to improve or to better yourself or to get a better job or better pay? There's nothing wrong with those things. But listen to what the Bible says. Psalm 37, 16, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Do you realize in this art there are wicked men, evil men, bad men, and they are very rich. They are exceeding rich. And yet the Bible says it's better to have a little, very little, enough to feed yourself for a day, enough to pay your rent for another week, just enough to get your family through. It is better to be righteous. What does it mean to be righteous? Upright in the word of God, to walk straightly, to walk direct, to be right with God. It's better to be like that than have all the riches of the wicked. For the, and this is the reason, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. You can have little. Do you realize God can be holding you up? That's what the Bible teaches. God himself is upholding you. And you know what the Hebrew means? It means to lift you and to carry you forward to your destination. The Bible says that a a righteous man with a little is being upheld by the Lord. Are you righteous? Do you have little? Then I want to tell you behind the scenes you go, how did I make it through? How did I go through all these things? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you how. I'll tell you who. Thank God. It is that the Lord is upholding the righteous and he carries them through all the trials. If you understand this principle of little things. Also in Proverbs 15, 16, it says better is little. I like that word better. It said better in Psalm 37, better than riches. Do you believe it? Better than riches. Having little is better than riches. Now in Proverbs 15, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Amen. You could have everything and great trouble. Great trouble. One of my favorite scriptures years ago, I lived in Scotland in the corner of a building, a little narrow room, only had one cupboard, a few boxes, had very little, could put everything in one bag. And I lived in the corner of that building. And when I got to Proverbs and it says, it's better to live in the corner of a large house, right in the corner of it, Amen. than in a broad room with a brawling woman. Yeah, yeah. It says something like that. And I said, Amen. Amen. I was a single guy and I said, I'd rather live in that little small room with these few possessions than to be in a broad room. And now, thank God, I'm not with a brawling woman. I'm with what the Scottish would call a bra woman. The Bible does say, better is little with the fear of the Lord. Make sure you have the fear of the Lord. I don't care how little you have, but I do care. Do you fear God? Do you fear God? Isaiah 28 verse 9, it says, Whom, and this is God speaking, Whom shall he teach knowledge to? Do you want to know how God teaches who God teaches and to whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Teach him knowledge, understand doctrine. This is who? Them that are weaned from the milk. Get in early, Hannah. Get in early. Those that are weaned. Do you realize someone weaned from their mother's milk? A godly mother, this little baby being weaned. All of this weaning. Not every woman weans, do they? But this Bible says wean. A baby that's weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Not every Christian woman can confess this because they don't do it. But here you have the Bible speaking about this, this little baby. So how is it this little baby becomes filled with the knowledge of God and gets filled with understanding doctrine? Do you realize I understood doctrine from a little child? How does it happen? And this is a scripture. I'm going to close on this. 
I've got 15 messages here, but we're going to close now. Listen very carefully. This is how you let, tra train up a little child filled with the knowledge of God. How are you going to do it? Is it a hard task? Is it impossible for a mother to do? Of course not. Listen, this is God's pattern. And if you don't know it and don't learn it, you'd miss it. You'd think you can't do this. It says, Isaiah 28, verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. And this is where I want to bring you and finish. Here a little and there a little. Do you realize what God has just said here? He says, whom shall he or I teach knowledge and train up understanding biblical doctrine? A little child weaned at its mother's womb. Will you just say a little word here? A little line here? A little precept? I believe in the church of our day, precepts have been lost. We want the dynamic. We want the big. We want to know how to do it. You haven't laid in precepts. You haven't laid in lines. You haven't done a little here and a little there. And it's causing wreck right across the body of Christ. Can I encourage you tonight? And I commit this message into your hands. And will you remember what my teacher at primary school taught about for the loss of a nail, an entire kingdom was lost. We're going to look at some wonderful things out of the scripture. Little things, insignificant, so easily missed. But if you miss them, you will regret it not only for time, but for all eternity. There's little things if you put in place, God will bless you tremendously in the years ahead. And no church will ever be blessed that neglects the precepts, the lines, the little things here and there. I am fanatical. I am radical. I've always been from a child at primary school. I've been from my mother's womb. Radical over little things, paying attention to detail, and obeying the little commands of Scripture. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we do thank you for the Word of God tonight. Just your wisdom displayed in these four little creatures, Lord God, that are remarkable creatures that you have created to teach us, to give us wisdom, to stir us. Father, I do pray that beginning tonight that you're going to open our eyes to the little things, the small things, the insignificant things, that we'll no longer use lack of faith, smallness of faith, smallness of ability as an excuse not to do the will of God. But Father, by faith in your word, we would see that we can raise up a great army, even through these messages online, through a little precept here and there, a line here and a line there, here a little thing and there a little thing. Lord God, that we can have an impact for the kingdom of God because this is your word. Will you bless your word tonight and bless and minister to every single individual. We love you and we bless you tonight in Jesus' name.